I'm Hanson Hossein. Welcome to Media Space. Our show focuses on the increasingly busy intersection between media and technology. We talk to creative thinkers on the hot button issues of our digital age. Together, we'll find out how communication technology is changing our lives right now and what might come next. In this episode, Monica Harrington calls herself the Forrest Gump of the Seattle startup scene. From Microsoft to Half-Life to cloud computing to the Gates Foundation, for more than two decades, she's been at the right place at the right time as an idea influencer. But Monica's success has nothing to do with luck. She's a storytelling strategist, a brilliant general who knows how to engage people from top to bottom, creating new markets by telling stories. So, is Monica ready to do it again with her latest product, Intersect, a website for sharing stories? And we have to ask, in the age of Facebook, is there actually still room for yet another social network? And we'll also bring you into our conversation with Monica. Use the Twitter hashtag Mediaspace, and we'll track your questions. Monica, welcome. Great. Thanks, Hanson. It's good to be here. So with Intersect, I mean, Jay Rosen from New York University says it's the first tool for self-informing public to share their stories. That's mm -hmm. quite high praise. It, we were thrilled. <laughs> we were absolutely thrilled that he reacted that way because that's how we feel about it. We think stories are really powerful and sharing stories in a way that uh, where you're contributing to the broader good is uh, not, it's fun and it uh, is helpful for the people that you're writing those stories for. So um, we were thrilled. So what did a, a leading light like Jay Rosen see in your platform that really inspired him to say something like that? What is so special about Intersect? Well, I think Jay also captured it. Uh, he tweeted at one point where uh, that Intersect was the everyone's a reporter tool. And that's also true. The essence of it is that we all uh, go through life having experiences. We uh, intersect with others. And um, being able to talk about those experiences and share them together is, um, there's a power in that. So I think what Jay was really responding to is that with tools like Intersect, you don't have to be a professional storyteller. You don't have to be a professional journalist in order to tell your stories in ways that others can discover them. So ex if you could summarize how it would work, because you've just come out of beta now, right? This mm -hmm. is now readily available to anybody. It's intersect.com. Right, and we just took off the invitation codes. So when somebody comes and signs up at Intersect, what's the first thing they're going to want to do? So the first thing they're going to want to do is we've got this, uh, we've got a timeline. Everybody has a personal timeline and a place where you can share a little bit about yourself. So um, what I'd encourage people to do is go to the site, explore some of the stories that are already there to get ideas, and then go ahead and share a little bit about yourself and start building your personal timeline. Tell some stories about some of the fun places that you've been, the experiences that you've had and uh, look at what other storytellers are doing because one of the things we find is that when uh, someone tells a story about an experience they've had, um, like going to a rock concert having, or having been to um, some event a while ago, it sparks a memory that then creates another story and there's almost this chain reaction that gets going. So what would be the difference between, we've got uh, an Intersect profile up here, this is Monica Guzman's uh, storyline, what would be the difference between posting a photograph and some text to say Facebook or even a blog versus posting it on Intersect? Yeah, well the cool thing about this is if you see this, uh, this was the night that Intersect won the Flashy Award. From uh, Tech Flash, they had their tech, big award. From so Tech Flash, it was the official name of the award was no longer in stealth. Because um, you guys were hiding all this time? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we really took the covers off in, uh, in late September. Um, and so uh, we've been really interested in how people are engaging with the site. But the key thing about this is Monica told a story um, about Peter accepting the uh, flashy Peter's award. Peter's the CEO of Intersect. Peter is the CEO of Intersect. And she positioned it here at the Experience Music Project because that's where the award ceremony took place. And you can see here that uh, Peter and Monica participated in the story. I was also there. So I could tell a story by clicking on the Were You There button. I can then add my story. So it's this community storytelling. And you might not even, you might not even know Monica or Peter exactly. to be able to make that connection, right? Exactly. Anybody who went to the uh, Flashy Awards that night um, could tell a story there. And if you think about it, what makes, a, um, what makes an event really interesting is not the official story of the event, but what were the experiences of the people who were there. Hmm. 
That's really interesting. I mean, other than the, the Flashy Award and, and Jay Rosen, the other, your other claim to fame very recently was that during Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert's big rallies in Washington, D.C., uh, I believe the Intersect was used, who was it used by? It was the Washington Post that it used It was Intersect? the Washington Post. And it was a really fun project that we did together to just illustrate what can happen when you combine uh, stories from a professional journalist perspective with the people who are actually uh, non-journalists who were there, um, who could give a uh, first-person perspective. So uh, what the Washington Post did was they streamed content from Intersect that included uh, contributions from Washington Post reporters, all of whom were using the, uh, the Intersect iPhone app, and, uh, and then also contributions from people who, were, who just happened to be at the rally and who were participating in the beta and wanted to contribute their stories. It's like and a collective storybook of exactly. an event, right? And so it's exactly. a combination of professional journalism and, I don't know if it's citizen journalism, or just people just sort of collecting their memories from a certain thing. Now here's yeah. the Washington Post page right here. Right, right. And so um, does it require for, to be really effective for you as a user? Do you have to have like a smartphone with a GPS enabled a camera to actually be relevant to make those connections? Does it have to have those GPS data in, built into your stories? Right, well right now we, uh, we have an iPhone app and it really makes the fun of posting to Intersect when you're uh, out and about and on the go really fun. But people can add their stories and perspectives um, through Flickr uh, and uh, we're working to incorporate other social media sites as well in terms of gathering the materials that go into a story. But if you've taken pictures of an event um, or told a story somewhere else, we want you to bring that into Intersect and, uh, because it's there where you see how your stories cross paths with other people. Well, even with your timeline, um it doesn't necessarily even require a digital photograph. I mean, you have to digitize a photograph, right. but you've got photographs on your timeline from when you were a kid. In fact, there's even this letter yes. that you wrote to Richard yes. Nixon. And yes. well, I don't know when you wrote that, but. Yeah, uh, I was encouraging him to start the EPA, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and this was in 1970, saying, you think Portland smelled essentially, and you've got yes. to do something about it. Yeah, and it's one of those things, it, you know, it was in reading this letter, I actually had forgotten that when I was a kid growing up in Portland, Oregon, the city smelled. I think most kids who are growing up today have no idea that uh, 40 years ago this was the case. But I suspect that other people who might come across this story, um, kids who weren't alive at the time, it'll be new information for them. But seeing a story that somebody else has told about an experience that you shared has this interesting way of sparking memories in really fun and interesting ways. So I hope other people who were in Portland in uh, and uh, around the time that I wrote this letter, we'll share their stories and, and perspectives. I'm amazed that somebody at, at, at your age at the time would actually be brave enough to write such an eloquent letter to Richard Nixon oh, to sort of do you. that about it. Thank but it's you. amazing. So if you've got a fully populated profile or timeline, mm -hmm. um, how do you feel as a user of Intersect of having a complete stranger come in and basically getting a really good sense of who you are? You're, it's, it requires like either a great deal of trust or just a great deal of courage to have that kind of exposure. Yeah, the really interesting thing that um, I think a lot of uh, professional writers have found and storytellers have found is that when you share uh, your stories, all kinds of rewards come back to you. So um, one of the things that I've done is I started sharing my perspectives on being in the high-tech industry on TechFlash. And it was just wonderful and kind of unbelievable the, um, the connections and uh, support that I got from people who said, oh, I was there too. This is kind of my perspective on that experience. And you realize that um, these, are, these are people I, I wouldn't have connected with otherwise. You know, but just that whole notion of being able to share your experiences in a way that other people can cross paths with um, is very powerful. And then each of us has um, their are areas of our life that we want to keep private, and uh, that will vary from person to person. And Intersect provides a way to tell uh, stories just to uh, a circle of friends, um, one or more circles of friends. But there's also the possibility to share an experience about something uh, with the broader community. And we think that there's a lot of um, that a lot of people will enjoy that and then start seeing the benefits of doing that. Um, it turns out you meet some pretty interesting people um, and you find out new things 
and uh, so we think there's a very social experience that can be had doing that. Well, that's, I mean, and that's you're, what it becomes is this uh, real life sort of virtual history book, right? In terms of exactly, but it's and it's capturing very personal, almost sometimes intimate stories as opposed to the grand lines of history in terms of war yes. and what people conquered yeah. and whatever else. Well, you know, from that perspective, um, so many of us when we grew up and we think about history and uh, the big events of our day and they're always told through the perspective of the leaders or most of the time it's you know we learned about dates and uh, and what President Roosevelt was doing and what Churchill was doing but if you think about it uh, World War II affected people from many different uh, walks of life and it's the power of their stories that's where the real history was made and so understanding the stories of um, of I, I want to say real people but uh, you know of course Roosevelt and Churchill were real people but they weren't the only people there and, we, were. and we know the most powerful uh, I don't know, artifacts or testimonies from those times have been mm -hmm. actually letters of say right. the common soldier when right. we actually had physical analog media. Now in the digital age where everything is, is, is not physical, yeah. uh, it sounds like we're almost in danger of losing something. So we we've got this particular platform. We even have Twitter. I heard that Twitter had given them millions of tweets to the Library of Congress or cataloging. Yeah. Is, are we able to hold on to those really important stories from a historical perspective through these new platforms? I sure hope so. If you think about um, what's happened over time, we are, we're all storytellers. We're born storytellers, and uh, in the last couple of decades, and I was a contributor to this, um, we moved from uh, a situation where we uh, wrote letters to one another to doing everything online. Well, I think most of us have had the experience where we had lots of wonderful emails, we shared lots of wonderful emails, and those emails are just gone. I know that I've lost, um, you know, many years of my life in terms of emails and interactions with friends and uh, and uh, some hopefully fun and interesting experiences. But I would like to share those with people. And I would love to read the stories and contributions of other people from that time. So I'm hoping that now um, people will write down some of those stories, capture some of those stories while they're still fresh mm -hmm. in their brain and moving forward that people can share some of those stories when they're fresh and when they're experiencing them and they can all become part of the Intersect fabric. And thanks to Intersect, we haven't lost William Shatner, it oh looks my like. <laughs> well, you know, it's really funny. I have to admit that, um, so I love Star Trek. I, um, I know it deeply. I was one of those people where um, in the original series, every time it came on, I was one of the first who could identify which episode it was after, you know, about three words had been spoken. Well, it turns out that Monica Guzman is also a Star Trek fan. It wasn't until I shared my story on Intersect that we knew that we had that common connection. And you guys work side by side. We work side <laughs> by side. But when were we gonna? When were we gonna be uh, talking about uh, television shows? We might have come across that topic, you know, later. But um, with Intersect, we could quickly explore each other's timeline and find those points of intersection. It's interesting. You, you said you played some role in this digitization of relationships. You you were there at the ground floor with Microsoft, right? Yes. With basically getting word out, getting yeah. word out about word. <laughs> um, I think you like being in the trenches. I mean, it sounds. I like, love being in the trenches. And, and, yeah. And this notion of, I mean, everybody talks about storytelling now, especially from the corporate point of view. I yeah. know that the General Electric puts a lot of their top top executives through storytelling training, but you have been doing this for years. You've managed to sort of pinpoint that opportunity, engage the right people. You did the same thing when your, your husband started Valve and, and created Half-Life. You, you realized that you, there was, again, a new market, I guess, PC games, and you had to, to figure out how to get people to get engaged with that. And what did you do to make Half-Life such a success? Well, the funny thing about Half-Life is I should say that uh, it was my husband, Mike, and Gabe Newell, who um, they decided to create a game company and uh, they decided which area they were going to focus in and my contribution was I understood the, um, the dynamics of that industry and I understood what it would take for this little company that nobody had ever heard of to achieve success and one of the things that, um, that I knew was that unless there was something just really breakthrough about the product, unless people could easily understand why it was so different, 
we, pro we were never going to get mind share. People weren't going to pay attention. And uh, the folks from id were actually doing, uh, they had a very popular product at that time. So the challenge became, how do we engage people in a, with a really terrific product, but tell the story in such a way that um, a broader audience of people engages in what we're doing? And we had some wonderful assets. Um, it, kind of ironically, what what uh, one of the strengths of Half Life was that uh, we actually had a storyteller on the team, and so the um, Half Life itself was all about bringing storytelling to the game experience and engaging those communities who would normally play the games to sort of say you went personally to those communities and sort of said yeah. this is what we've got help us, work with yeah. us, and that's like that's a revolutionary way of doing things back then. Yeah, I think, that, I think the key thing about it is just understanding who could get excited about the potential of what we were doing, and it turns out that at that time it was the, um, it was other game developers, because it's almost like the music business, the game development business at that time was, uh, it, there were all of these really talented guys basically trying to do games that uh, they wanted to play and that they wanted to find interesting. It wasn't a winner-take-all business at all. And what we understood was that if we did something really cool and shared it with our peers in the industry, that if we did a good job, um, actually if we did a great job, that they would support us. And so I began, became engaged in the process of helping this, them understand uh, what we were doing and why we were doing it. Great. Well, let's break for a minute, and when we return, questions for Margaret from you. Now, let's take a look at the hashtag MediaSpace Twitter feed. One of the questions we see here, based on your question to Richard, your letter yeah. to Richard Nixon, if you wanted to write the president today, what would you have done versus a letter? How would you sort of use your digital media influence to, to reach out this way? I think the key thing is, uh, what is it that I'd want to write to him about? What is it that I'm passionate enough about? Um, so for example, in that particular case, in, in the 70s, I was concerned about um, the dirty air in Portland, Oregon, and wanted to draw that to his attention. Um, today, if I wanted to uh, get his attention around an issue I care about, climate change is one. I think the key is uh, telling a story about uh, its impact and implications in a way that other people also want to add their stories. And it's the power of our collective voice that I would want to draw to his attention. Okay. So, um, and actually, I, I uh, am engaged with some people who think very seriously about that, so it's not, it's not academic. Okay. In fact, yeah. you had mentioned, um, you, you did some work for the Gates Foundation uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago where you were helping figure out their communication strategy. What would have happened when you were working with the Gates Foundation communication-wise if Intersect existed at that point? Oh, my gosh. I would, I would have loved to have had Intersect when I was at the Gates Foundation because one of the things that happens there that people don't think about is what the Gates Foundation is is a funding organization for other people to do their work. And so many of the really interesting stories about how that work is going and what's happening in the field is um, best told by the people who are on the front lines. And so if I'd had a way for people to tell those stories um, such that they could, they could bubble up and they could cross paths and intersect, and I could draw attention to those stories, that would have been enormously powerful. So, um, and you're giving up control along the way. You're actually oh gosh, engaging yes. people who are interested in what you're doing, but you can't really drive that mes message anymore, right? Right, right. The whole notion that uh, you can drive communications centrally and really clamp down on it, um, that whole model is going out the window. And so what people have to understand is you're creating a culture where people at all levels uh, need to communicate about your organization or about your cause. And you find ways to connect those voices together in interesting ways, and that's where power comes from. Um, if you think about what is happening in the corporate world, uh, if, a, if a company is really smart, they're listening very intently to the voices in social media and they have their ear to the ground. Well, that 
uh, creates a feedback loop where you want to contribute to that um, discussion interaction. So if you know somebody's paying attention to those stories, tell it. That's great. One of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on the show is because given your incredible track record with, with Half-Life and Picnic, the Gates Foundation and Microsoft, I said, well, if Monica Harrington's involved with Intersect, it's going to be successful. So mm -hmm. from a startup point of view, mm -hmm. what do you think of these consumer-driven innovations like Intersect uh, um, in terms of sort of playing the startup uh, game? It's, it's really a tough one to do when you're looking at trying to create a new pro a product that is targeting consumers specifically? Yeah, well the, the cool thing about it is that your consumers are always, it's your, it's your users who are always, um, they're in essence creating the product with you. And so although, they, although you might have a concept and you go out and you develop against that concept, whatever you start with evolves with the feedback of real users. And um, this was actually, it was a process that I understood very well at Word. I actually used to go out and uh, meet with user groups around the country. And it was that feedback, that input that fed uh, future versions. And uh, so if you have that combination of what users want and an eye toward how technology is evolving, you can find that sweet spot. That's, that's, and, that's, and that came from our Twitter feed, that question, by the way. So to follow up with that then, let's just assume you're going to be as successful with Intersect as you have been with your, your other startups that became really great products. Where do you see Intersect in our great internet communication products two or three years from now? You know, right now we're really focused on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. How mm -hmm. does Intersect fall into that? Yeah, well, I think the key thing for people to remember is that we've often been in these situations where we think whatever the set of tools is that's out there, is that's the set of tools that's going to be there moving forward. And um, I have experience where, uh, you know, more than 90% of the people were using WordPerfect at one time. And before that, more than 90% of the people, I actually don't know the specific market share, were using WordStar. And that has completely changed. Um, there's always opportunities. Uh, to do something new and innovative and change the dynamics of a space. Um, and so you're not daunted at all by the fact that people think that Facebook is now social networking, like Google search, and there's no more room for these kind of platforms. Yeah, and I, and I, uh, uh, those companies, I'm sure they don't view it that way. In terms, it, it, they have to be thinking, not just where is my company today, where is the product today, but where does it need to be in the future? Well, the thing about a startup that you have is that you can take an idea um, and you can move forward against that idea. One advantage that you have is that you don't have an installed base that you need to, um, where you need to protect things. So for example, with uh, Picnic, we were able to move very aggressively. And Picnic was an online photo editing exactly. uh, program. Exactly. Yeah, we were, um, we were able to move very aggressively into the online photo editing space in a way that Adobe couldn't. Because for Adobe to move into that space, it would mean uh, very, it's super aggressively. It, it would mean that you are um, creating a whole new set of rules, and they were doing very well with the set of rules that they'd already established around uh, shrink-wrapped photo editing products. Um, and so in a similar vein, I think we can just take a new approach to what's happening on the social web and engage people in a new way, but also taking advantage of both Twitter and Facebook because we view those as crucial communication tools. That's great. It sounds like, I mean, you pretty much summed up the innovator's dilemma when it comes to sort of new products and old products and being able to keep an eye on that. So I, I'm glad that you're optimistic, and I'm optimistic as well. I, I, I played with Intersect, and I think it is a fabulous platform, and I, I very much wish you the best of luck as you move Thank forward you. with it. And thank you for joining Thank us. you. Thanks. Thank you so much. So here's a special invite to our live web audience. Join me tomorrow at the Seattle Public Library downtown for a rapid response public conversation about WikiLeaks. Go to mcdmpublic.com for more information on attending or watching the event live online. And thank you all for joining us today. Tune in again next month online and on air for our next episode of Media Space. I'm Hanson Hossein. We'll leave you with some concluding thoughts from our best-selling author, Scott Birkin. The word innovation has seen better days. It's used so often for so many things, it's lost whatever teeth it ever had. The best definition of the word is significant positive change. We call electricity or the jet airplane an innovation because it made us dramatically more powerful in our daily lives.
But simply because someone makes a nice profit or has a successful business doesn't guarantee any positive change has happened. You're not an innovator simply for doing something new or for being successful unless you simultaneously improve things for the world at large. Companies like Enron, BP, or Goldman Sachs were all called innovators at one time or another and profited heavily from things that hurt us as a people and a country. They profited from empty promises, something the people who labeled them innovators should be ashamed of. I think we'd all be better off if we didn't make the same kinds of mistakes today. And we can do that by being more careful about what we label as innovative. While it's fantastic to see places where people start businesses, create movements, and push for change, and it's good for communities to invest in new things and create businesses that fuel economies, at the same time, we should be proud of people who take risks and bet their careers on new ideas. But all that's the means, not the ends. Innovation is best thought of as an end. It's an effect. It's something best said about the results of your efforts, not the efforts themselves. I'm Scott Birkin for Media Space. Yeah.